Hi, welcome back to the History of World Civilizations. This is the second part of Session 6. In the first part of Session 6, we were looking at the effects of trading empires, and I was using Spain's empire in the Americas uh, to provide the specific example. And we were looking particularly at the effects of trading empires. And in that case, what it involved were the transformations that were brought by the Spanish to the New World, including the demographic disaster, but also the uh, mass conversion of the population to Christianity, creation of a mercantile network, the development of haciendas and mining operations, all of these changes that were brought to the New World, even as much of indigenous culture survived, there were still significant transformations as a result of the presence of the Spanish. And I also talked about the slave trade in terms of meeting the labor needs of the Western Hemisphere and how that helped create a distinct culture and ethnic population in the Caribbean as we see the rise of an Afro-Creole population uh, in the absence of the indigenous population which had been destroyed by pandemic disease. Today we're going to continue looking at the effects of this empire, but we're going to look in a lot broader context. Because today we're going to talk about uh, various precious goods that were part of the trade of Spain and the influence that these products could have on the course of modern history. And as we'll see, those effects are numerous. First of all, looking at the first slide, the focus of trading empires at this time was in fact on precious goods. Silver, spices, slaves, silks, sugar. All of these products, at least initially, were ones that were possessed of high value for small volumes. In other words, a very small amount of one of these products cost a lot of money. Why would they specialize in such products? Because, of course, even though there have been major advances in shipping, the truth is that ships remain relatively small. If you've been down to Corpus Christi, seen the replicas of the Nina the Pinta the Santa Maria, you realize Columbus was not exactly sailing you know, in a massive steamship. Uh, when he came over to the New World. There's not a lot of room for cargo. So whatever goods are going to be transported, they have to be high value goods. There's not much sense in sending, you know, like clay bricks across the Atlantic. You're not going to make a lot of money on that. At the same time, as we will see, two of these products, silver and sugar, were goods that would have profound effects upon the world economy and upon various human societies there's going to be a massive transformation. Hmm? And those transformations are going to be impacted from the phenomena I have listed here. One is price revolution. The massive flow of silver out of the Western Hemisphere and into Western Europe set off an inflationary spiral that I briefly mentioned before. We're going to look at it in more detail today. And we're going to look at it not simply in, well, gee, that's how much prices went up. OK, so what? But the fact is, that inflationary process, combined with some other factors, rapidly altered the economies of Europe and later would have profound effects on the rest of the world. It's one of the things that contributes to the rise of capitalism that becomes, of course, the dominant economic system of the globe by the end of the 20th century. Its roots are in part here in the silver trade being shipped back to Europe. Sugar also has significant effects. Sugar starts out in the 1400s as a precious good. Very small amounts commanding very high prices. But over time, over the next several centuries, it would become a mass consumer product. You might call it the first mass consumer food product. So it shifts from being a precious good to a good of mass consumption. And what that means is suddenly you've got an economic activity, which is unlike anything that's occurred in the past, where you're having mass production of a product and its shipment over long distances. Up until now, silks, spices, 
All of these things were high value per volume. Sugar is going to lead to a change. And it means not only a change in trade itself, it means a change in how people produce goods. It puts all kinds of demands on economic systems, on the value of economies of scale. In other words, if you can produce large amounts of something, you can sell it at a low price and still make a profit. That's the bottom line with economies of scale. It's cheaper to produce thousands of some item than it is to produce a few dozen. Uh, HD TVs, yeah, if you've been foolish enough to invest in one already. Uh, started out thousands of dollars, even for a relatively small one. Now they're getting down to 900, 800 for smaller ones. Why? Because economies of scale are kicking in. Well, sugar helps set off that kind of process for the global economy all the way back in the 1500s and the 1600s when it became a product that could be produced on a mass scale, whose price could be lowered, and as a result, it could become a good of mass consumption. One other thing that we're going to look at, which is another significant development, is piracy. Hmm? Now, there were pirates all the way back in the ancient world, hmm? but piracy would flourish in these centuries of the trading empires. And they would flourish largely because of the restrictive trade networks that were created by the Portuguese, the Spanish, and these other trading empires. They created the conditions which made piracy on a large scale quite appealing and quite profitable. In many ways, pirates were sort of the first advocates of free trade. <laughs> they went around stealing stuff because prices were high as a result of restrictive trade mechanisms, and so they wanted to open up the market and lower prices. Hmm. Pirates and smugglers together helped do that. They helped bring about what eventually became an era of free trade, all with their efforts starting back again in the 1500s and the 1600s. So a series of truly significant changes are about to affect not only Europe, but the world as a whole. And much of what happens in these changes is directly traceable to these products coming out of the Western Hemisphere beginning really in the mid-1500s. First of all, looking at piracy and smuggling. Piracy, of course, is basically thievery on the high seas. You call it burglary or robbery in any other time, but you steal stuff at, at sea and you call it piracy. Smuggling, of course, is moving goods illegally within trading networks, either because you haven't paid the tariff or the tax that's required, or trade in this particular good is prohibited in a region that's smuggling. Hmm. Piracy and smuggling were a response to the irrationalities of trading empires. Hmm. Specifically, those trading empires like Spain, Portugal, and later the British with hmm, their colonies in the New World, uh, trading systems that were based on mercantilism, based on, as we've seen with the Spanish Empire, these closed trading systems. Hmm. And I say irrationalities. Hmm. What I mean is that these kinds of restrictions hmm, created conditions that were aberrations. Hmm. they were not the normal operating conditions of economies in which free trade existed. Mm -hmm. One example of an irrationality, monopoly pricing. If indeed the Portuguese can seriously restrict the trade in spices coming from the Indian Ocean, they can charge much more than the market would bear otherwise. Mm -hmm. If it weren't for the Portuguese, there'd be more spices, the prices would be lower. Slaves. Hmm. The Portuguese create a monopoly on the slave trade from West Africa. Again, you're restricting the flow of this commodity, these human beings, and you're driving up the price. Silver with the Spanish. They restrict the flow of silver. They control it. They tax it. They take a share of it. And all of these mechanisms of control drive up the prices of these commodities. 
So Spain and Portugal, hmm, with their respective trading systems, are creating situations where there are artificial prices, where prices are artificially high. Hmm. You can see this in the modern world. Sometimes corporations manipulate prices. They all agree uh, to fix a price for a good at a certain price. Well, the trading empires were doing that 500 years ago. Hmm. It's still an irrationality. Hmm. It's not the logical way that markets should work. Something else that was an irrationality that occurred in these trading networks were supply shortages. Inevitably, these closed systems, whether it was the British dealing with their 13 colonies in North America, the Spanish in the Americas, Portugal with its extended trade network into the Indian Ocean, inevitably, <laughs> supply shortages occurred. They were never able to satisfy the needs of their own economic actors. Prime example, again, the Spanish Empire in the Americas. There's supposed to be two fleets that sail every year from Spain to the New World hmm, to supply it with goods that are needed. Yeah, but often they don't sail. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's none. And inevitably, there are acute shortages of products that are needed in the New World. The answer? Smuggling. People smuggle goods in because it's illegal to be bringing goods in that didn't come directly from Spain, from one of the two ports, hmm. Sevilla or Cadiz. OK, so well, we can't go on without these products that we need. We need hardware. We need iron tools to do our work. So we smuggle them in. So this irrationality of simple shortages that occur in these systems that don't function terribly well leads to massive smuggling within these supposedly closed networks. One other thing that contributed especially to smuggling uh, was the fact that bureaucracies in the early modern world really weren't that efficient. In fact, in most bureaucracies, people got their jobs <coughs> by buying the job, by spending money to go out and purchase the job, something that's a little alien to us in the 21st century. The idea usually is, well, somebody has a job, I go apply for it, and they pay me to do the job. Uh, in this system, you went and purchased the job. And generally, it came with little or no salary. <laughs> Sounds like a very bad investment. Uh, except for the fact that in holding an official position, what you could do is take bribes. So most systems of bureaucracy that controlled trading networks leaked like sieves because the bureaucrats in charge of enforcing the rules were taking bribes left and right. That's the way the system worked. So these inefficient bureaucracies mean that, yes, indeed, smuggling can flourish in response to the irrationalities created by these closed systems. So these are some of the forces that lead to piracy and smuggling in the early modern world. And they're a direct outgrowth of the closed trading networks that various empires create. Now, this is a map of the Caribbean, more or less. Uh, up here is Veracruz, Mexico. Down here is Portobello. These two spots, Portobello and what is now Panama, and Veracruz and what is now Mexico, were the two places where all shipping between Spain and the New World had to go. No place else. The importance of this is not only, again, as a mechanism of control by the Spanish, but when you think about it, this is not a very large area of water. And yet here, concentrated in this relatively small space, is some of the most valuable cargo in the world, the silver being shipped out massive amounts of it, and all the ships have to go in and out of these relatively narrow passages. Okay, so, so if you're a pirate, what could be better than one, having incredibly valuable cargoes, and two, having a relatively restricted, I mean, it's still a pretty big sea, but still, you know the two places where all the ships are going to either go in or come out. You don't have to be a genius. To figure out, well, <laughs> I want to hang around those places and I'll probably attack them. Uh, initially, as we'll see, 
uh, pirates had a problem, um, and that was that Spain controlled all of the Caribbean. You look at all these islands like Cuba and Hispaniola, uh, all of these islands, and what is now Puerto Rico and down to Trinidad, all of the islands are controlled by the Spanish. And of course, the pirates are from other European countries, so they have to come all the way across the Atlantic, take a shot at the Spanish, try to seize some cargo, and sail, sail all the way home, because there's no safe place to land, because the Spanish control all the islands. So initially, smuggling isn't going to be that intense, but we will see a change over time when some of these islands switch hands. In the short term, pirates would be a nuisance, but not a huge problem, because the pirates couldn't stick around for very long, they had no place to safely land and escape from the Spanish and their naval vessels. Again, pirates came to the Caribbean for the same reason that people rob banks. It's where the money is. So pirates are driven by usually one basic motive, money, to steal it. However, there's more to it than just a few people who want to steal money. That's all it was. It wouldn't be that big a story. But the pirates were often being authorized to steal and being assisted in their programs of theft by European governments who wanted to use them as a mechanism to expand their own power. Part of this, of course, was simply that Spain had tapped into this incredibly valuable resource of these silver mines in Mexico and South America. So if you can steal it from the Spanish, that's that much more that you have. And the other thing is, in stealing it from the Spanish, you hope to some degree to weaken them. And the British are going to be particularly active in this field, because remember, they're one of the late starters in the whole game of creating trading empires. So one way to catch up is steal the other guy's stuff. Uh, and that's what they will do. So piracy is never just, oh, it's a bunch of guys with a ship and a patch over their eyes and they stole something. It's always involves some degree of political activity, of conflict between states. The pirates usually were being directly authorized by their governments to go out and do this. Now they had their own motives, of course, which is to steal stuff, but they actually had political authorization and at times they had political and even military cover for what they were doing. Over the next several centuries, from roughly the middle of the 16th century, from 1550s up to about the 1720s, pirates will evolve through three stages. The first stage was as privateers. And this refers to the fact that, indeed, these people had direct authorization from their mother countries to go out and conduct piratical activities in the Caribbean. Hmm. So they would sail, let us say, from England, a common sailing point, and go to the Caribbean with an authorization from the English crown to steal stuff. Hmm. And then they would have to go back, of course, because there was no place to land. Later, as the European powers started acquiring some of those Caribbean islands and footholds in the Caribbean, then a new phase of pirating would occur with the so-called buccaneers. They were pirates who, in fact, did operate from land bases in the Caribbean because now other European powers besides Spain had a foothold there. They still operated, however, with authorizations, if not directly from England and France, then from local British and French governors to do what they were going to do, just steal stuff. The final phase came when pirates began to abandon this idea of essentially contracting, working for a particular government back in Europe, and simply went after any kind of shipping that was there in the Caribbean. You know, the so-called freebooters, they would attack anybody. It might be, you might be a British pirate, but you'd go out and attack a British merchant vessel. So these are the three stages that piracy goes through in the Caribbean, from the 1550s to about the 1720s. But throughout this time, the lure of silver and the issue of political support 
from European dynasties plays an important role in what the pirates are doing and their degree of success. So in the Caribbean, the Dutch, and the French, the British would all wage an indirect war on the Spanish Empire using these pirates in their various forms over several centuries to siphon off at least some portion of the silver coming out of the Americas. Hmm. Now, some of these people, well-known privateers like John Hawkins and his nephew, Francis Drake, these gentlemen operating back in the 16th century, the 1500s, focused on two areas. First, what they would do commonly is they would go to the west coast of Africa where they were excluded from the slave trade and they would steal slaves. They would attack a slave ship, steal the slaves and then take them to the New World and sell them to Spanish colonists. That helped ensure that even if they had to go back and forth and didn't manage to make a major strike on a Spanish treasure ship, that they still made money because they arrived with slaves in hand to sell to the Spanish colonists. And then secondly, after doing that, they had the opportunity to look for potential targets and to attack Spanish treasure, treasure vessels. So these are the early privateers, the ones that have to cross back and forth from the Atlantic into the Caribbean because their countries do not have footholds in the Caribbean at this time. But this changed significantly when the British seized Jamaica in 1655. The Spanish were never able to fully fortify all of these islands in the Caribbean. It just wasn't feasible and some of the islands just weren't that valuable. So eventually the other European powers were going to manage to clip off pieces of the Caribbean. And they had already done some of this, but the, the major turn of events is when Jamaica, or a fairly substantial island in size, is seized by the British in 1655 and not surprisingly becomes the headquarters for pirates throughout the Caribbean. As the British are, of course, anxious to continue their indirect war upon the Spanish, and they are welcoming of any pirate group, essentially, that wants to attack the Spanish, and they can make some money out of it as well. This, is, again, is the age of the buccaneers, people like Henry Morgan, uh, who was famous for attacks on uh, not only Spanish shipping, but Spanish colonial outposts, such as in Panama, a logical place to go, because that's where much of the treasure is shipped out of South America. People like Morgan had the advantage that they could operate out of Jamaica and still have the support, in this case, of the British governor of Jamaica uh, to launch their attacks upon the Spanish and their trade in the Caribbean. So this actually is an escalation of the attacks by pirates on the Spanish because now they can operate from local bases. Now they can operate virtually year round in attacking the Spanish and their shipping networks. However, just when things were going so well, times began to change. One of the problems was that sugar came to the British West Indies, islands like Jamaica. Hmm. When the British first captured some of these islands in the Caribbean, they really weren't worth much. Hmm. There was nothing really there. There was some forests and you could do some fishing, but there wasn't a lot of value. Hmm. But once sugar began to be produced on islands like Jamaica, suddenly the benefits of supporting pirates began to be reduced. There are now wealthy sugar growers in places like Jamaica. And the fact is they know that these pirates don't always focus just on the Spanish. <laughs> Sometimes they'll come in and invade a sugar plantation and steal everything from it, and maybe kill the owner uh, just for laughs. So suddenly this idea that the British possessions, Dutch possessions, French possessions in the Caribbean 
have nothing but gain to secure from piracy begins to change. Now many of the local colonists are saying, uh, we're not so sure about supporting pirates anymore <laughs> because we have other ways of making money. We don't have to rely on the trade generated by the pirates. This attitude was strengthened by the Treaty of Madrid in 1670. It was a treaty between Spain and Great Britain. And the importance of it was one thing, that the Spanish now recognized the legitimacy of British colonies in the Caribbean. They now recognized the legality of the British occupation of places like Jamaica. So, at least to some extent, the British government now has an incentive not to attack the Spanish, because the Spanish are now willing to allow them to function in the Caribbean. <laughs> A further setback, shall we say, to the pirates was the evolution of the freebooter pirate. People who, as I mentioned earlier, were not loyal to any particular flag and would attack any particular group that they chose to. Again, in some ways, as a response to the pirates, the pirates realized they're not exactly loved the way they were in the past before the sugar industry began to develop in the West Indies. Uh, now there's not quite the welcoming that they used to get. So they're less inclined to be selective in regards to the kind of shipping they attack. And British pirates may well attack British ships and French pirates attack French ships. This further antagonizes the relationship between the state and the pirates doing their bidding or were doing their bidding in the past. Now there's an increasing tension between the two sides. This was further exacerbated by the Treaty of Utrecht at early in the 18th century when Britain, through this treaty, got the rights to the asiento, oh, to participate in it. Was it. What was it? The slave trade. It was the right to participate in the slave trade in West Africa. So that meant now they really didn't need the pirates. They had the valuable slave trader could participate in it. They had sugar islands that were highly prosperous in the Caribbean. And pirates are almost as much a threat to the British and the French and the Dutch now as they were to the Spanish in the past. So we're going to see a significant decline in piracy in the early part of the 18th century. But while it lasted, the pirates had served important functions in terms of attacking the Spanish monopoly enhancing the power of other European states in the Caribbean. Now, along with piracy, there was also, of course, massive smuggling. Although, as is usually the case, most of the smuggling is not being done by foreigners, though they, they certainly participate. We saw how the British privateers would bring slaves from Africa uh, to smuggle into the Americas. But much of it is being done by the Spanish themselves, just as with the Portuguese system, they faced massive smuggling from within their own system. The classic example is Portobello. Portobello, the trading center for the Spanish, located on the Panamanian Isthmus. It became the trading center for the Spanish with South America in 1597. And originally, it was literally just a sort of spot on the beach. But each year, the treasure trains, mule trains, would come up from South America carrying the silver. Ships would arrive from Spain. And suddenly, a massive marketing fair would break out in Portobello. And huge sums of silver would be exchanged for European goods being brought over. So the Portobello fairs become one of the key nexus points, exchange points for goods coming from Europe and being exchanged for the silver of South America. All of this, again, was tightly controlled by the Spanish. Only Spanish ships, only people with Spanish authorization, that was basically the Spanish, could send ships to Portobello. 
And of course, the silver coming up from the mines in Potosi in South America was closely regulated. The crown took one-fifth right off the top. So prices of both goods coming in and the price of silver going out are extraordinarily high. And what that means is there's increasing amounts of smuggling. Porto Bello, again, becomes this trading center in 1597. A little over 100 years later, it's been estimated that 80% of all the trade that was occurring in Portobello, 100 years later, 80% of it was smuggled. So only 20% of it was legitimate, was paying the taxes and being brought over properly by only Spanish ships and Spanish merchants. Only 20% of it fell into the category of legitimate trade. The other 80% was all smuggling. And again, if you ask, you know, why would that happen? <laughs> because, of course, everyone in the network stands to benefit, well, except for the crown itself, from smuggling. <laughs> Sailors <laughs> found ingenious places in their body to hide small silver ingots. <laughs> Painful sometimes, but <laughs> they'd still hide them. <laughs> Merchant captains <laughs> would create compartments in their bulkheads where they would hide silver ingots. The bureaucrats who oversaw the trade, of course, readily accepted bribes to look the other way, whether it was smuggled silver coming out or smuggled goods coming in. So everyone that works in this network, because these irrationalities have been created, these extraordinarily high prices, benefits from the fact that if they smuggle the stuff, they can make a fortune. You know, if you're causing the price of a good to be 100, 200% higher than it would be if markets were just free and people were free to just exchange goods, just think of the opportunities, 100% profit. You can double your money, triple your money. If you can just manage to smuggle those few ingots or those few bolts of silk in or out of Portobello. The official price is 300 pesos. Your cost is less than 100. You can double your money, triple it. So the irrationalities of these trading monopolies created such vast price differentials, they made it only good sense, really, economically, for everyone involved in this system uh, to be involved in some degree of smuggling. So as much as the pirates caused problems by stealing treasure off the ships, the much larger problem in the end was really the smuggling that went on uh, that sapped so much of this product out of the official system and away from the hands of the Spanish crown. Now, shifting to the other side of the world for a moment, if we look at Portugal again and its trading networks in the Indian Ocean, the Portuguese had done two things. One, they had set up a licensing system. That's what a Qatar's was. You had to secure a Qatar's, a license, in order to conduct trade. Places like the Indian Ocean off the west coast of India. And this was a way of the Portuguese essentially taxing trade. And they did it because they could. <coughs> because they could see ships and they might be Hindu, they might be Muslim merchants, it didn't make any difference. And the Portuguese would say, well, you don't have a Qatar. We require a license to operate in this area. So we're going to seize your cargo. Hmm. The more expansive project, of course, was when the Portuguese had set up their choke points. And we talked about Malacca and the Strait of Hormuz, key points from the Spice Islands across the Indian Ocean to the Middle East where the Portuguese established military control and then used that to control the spice trade or to try to control it. They never completely and successfully did that. And of course they faced massive smuggling as well. A small box of spice for a sailor smuggled into Europe could mean a profit that might provide a lifetime of earnings. Just that one small box. 
And of course, just like Spanish sailors, they could figure out a lot of unpleasant places in their body to hide it. Something else that the Portuguese did was to try to force the various ports along the coast of the Indian subcontinent, which were individual principalities. They were basically city-states, like Genoa. Tried to force these ports to accept only Portuguese trade. Now, of course, this was absolutely diametrically opposed to what these individual trading ports relied on. Their key mechanism was to allow everyone, whether the Chinese, Arab, Hindu, to come and trade in their port. And then they just tax the trade. To give in to the Portuguese demand for monopoly would have meant essentially the death of the system that they had prospered from for so long. So the ports and the merchants fought back. And what they did was they used their own vessels to attack the Spanish, or rather the Portuguese, warships that tried to impose this monopoly. The Portuguese turned around and said, well, what those people are that are attacking us, they're pirates. They were known as the pirates of the Malabar coast, because that was the term used to describe the southwestern coast of India. So who were these pirates? They were merchants. And they had been conducting trade here for generations. But of course, when the Portuguese try to impose this monopolistic system that will benefit only the Portuguese, they fight back and they attack the Portuguese. But in the eyes of the Portuguese, they're pirates. Again, we see the irrationalities that develop and the conflicts that develop as the European trading empires try to create these monopolistic systems uh, that will serve only their interests and exclude other groups. If anything, the Europeans at this time are the ones who are largely opposed to free trade. They are the ones who want closed trading networks that they think they can benefit from the most. Now, aside from this struggle over free trade and the role of pirates and smugglers in reasserting the idea of open markets, a second major influence of the Spanish Empire in the Americas especially, and this trade in pre precious goods, was the European Price Revolution, which occurred roughly from 1500 to 1650. <laughs> Now, you'll notice the date says 1500 to 1650. Since Columbus didn't get to the New World to 1492, and Pizarro didn't manage to conquer the Incas until the 1530s, uh, obviously, silver didn't start flowing out of the Americas in significant quantities until about the middle of the 1500s. But the price revolution started before that, so obviously, Silver from the Americas is not the only reason that prices started to rise. Another factor was that there were significant discoveries of silver deposits in Central Europe around this time, around 1500. So for about 50 years, there was an increased flow of silver into the European economies, not from the Americas, but coming from mines within Europe itself. But that was nothing compared to what was about to flood Europe from the Americas. Spanish-American silver between 1550 and 1800 amounted to at least 100,000 tons. An extraordinary amount of silver, of currency, because that's what it really served as, that flowed into these economies. Now, of course, Spain has a mercantilist system. So it sends goods to the New World, brings the silver back, and does this all in this closed network. Not, because it never worked the way it was supposed to work. Spain quickly discovered, as its colonies began to develop, 
that it did not have the capacity to produce all of the products that were <laughs> needed by those colonies. Whether it was glassware, hardware, fabrics, textiles, there were an array of products that Spain could not adequately supply to its colonies. So what the Spanish merchants who had the monopoly on trade with the Americas did is they began buying the products they needed to ship to the Americas from places like England, France, the Netherlands. So it's supposed to be a closed system. But the truth is that most of the silver in the end that does get through to Spain will flow through Spain and out into the rest of Europe. In fact, if you look at, and they've done maps of this, that if you take Spain and then look at the rest of Europe, if you look at the France, England, the Netherlands, the places that were most involved in supplying Spain with goods for its colonies, those are the places where inflation is the worst in this 150-year period. Why? Because they are the principal recipients of all the silver flowing from the New World. And again, as I explained last time, it's simply a matter of you're producing a huge amount of currency. And that currency, let's say dollars, are chasing a limited number of goods. And so people are bidding up the price of products because there's this huge infusion of silver currency into Europe. And although price increases might not seem that high, I'll give you some statistics in a minute, Five, six, seven percent a year, not too bad. We get worried if it's you know, more than four percent a year. But the fact was, inflation just hadn't been occurring hmm, in earlier centuries. Hmm. Part of the reason was that there was always a shortage of specie, of precious metals that were used as currency. Silver, gold, were always in short supply. Even in the New World, where all of this hmm, silver is being created, most people worked on credit. Now, if you had to buy something from a merchant, you'd usually he'd extend your credit, you'd buy the product, and then when you had whatever, you know, some cattle hides or whatever, you'd give those to the merchant to pay for what you had. It was basically a barter system because there wasn't enough currency around to pay for things. <laughs> so it was a little hard to drive prices up if there's no circulating currency. And if the basis of currency, such as silver or gold, is in short supply. Again, that's going to help keep down inflation. And if trade is limited because of technological limitations, long distance trade, for example, overland trade is particularly difficult. If that's limited, then again, markets are going to be limited and the idea of bidding up the price of goods is going to be limited in its impact. So all of these things meant inflation wasn't really a problem in the ancient world. But now, suddenly it's become a problem. It may only be 5 or 6% a year, but 5 or 6% a year is a heck of a lot if it's been zero for the last 1,000 years, which is an exaggeration, but you get the idea. A little bit hurts a lot when there's been none at all. So what we find is in Europe, when we look at the major trading partners of Spain, if we look at the next slide, uh, you'll see that these particular locations, France, England, and the Netherlands, as I suggested, they become the places where the most infusions of silver bullion occur in Europe. And as silver flows into foreign hands, be they British, Dutch, and French, price increases across Western Europe mostly. If you go to Eastern Europe, you don't see much of this because they're far removed from these flows of silver bullion. But price increases over the course of about 150 years uh, amounted to 600%, which again, if you figure out, well, that's not so bad. That's only like three or 4% a year. Doesn't sound like much. It's a lot if you're used to none at all. In this country back in the 1970s, we started getting into double digit inflation. People were horrified you know, that prices might go up 10% in a year. I've lived in societies where prices have gone up 500% a year. 
Nobody seemed to notice. Uh, but in this country, used to minimal inflationary levels of, you know, one, two percent a year, for inflation to reach 10 percent was considered catastrophic. It was going to take huge adjustments of the economy. So too in Europe, back in the early modern era. Now, the influx of silver alone can't explain all of the price revolution. After all, if you had poured silver into a relatively sparsely populated area with little in the way of industrial capacity, et cetera, you wouldn't really notice inflation because economic activity would be at such a low level, it really wouldn't have much of an impact. So obviously other things were happening. One of the important things was that by now the European population, some 200 years after the Black Death, is rebounding. Population is growing again. So there are more people with more demands. Urbanization is going on. More people are living in urban centers. So what? In urban areas, it's even more critical that you have currency or species. Because it's much more likely you're engaged in activities like trade, like artisan production, where you can't just easily barter products. You need a currency so you can say, well, if you want to buy this, I'm not going to wait around six months where you go get a bolt of silk or something. I want to get paid now, so give me a silver coin or something. One of your children. Uh, something, but I want something now. I don't want to wait six months to get whatever it is you're growing or grazing or whatever. So in urban economies, the need for a medium of exchange rather than simply a barter system is all that much more important. In addition, it was also true that with the increasing population moving into urban areas, it's not that the countryside was barren of people. It's just that the percentage of the population devoted to agriculture was lower than it had been in previous centuries. So in the short term, as people are moving into cities, they're going to be the ones who need food. And they need it from the countryside. But at the same time, the numbers of people are not as great as they used to be. The population density out in the countryside is not as intense as it once was several centuries earlier. What that means is food production, at least temporarily, is not going to quite be able to keep up with the urban demands. It's going to take time. It's going to take, one, increased population, two, technological changes that will make agriculture more efficient and able to produce more product. But in the short term, there is a relative shortage a gap between what's being produced in agriculture and the demands that are being put on it by growing urban populations. So these other factors were also nudging prices up. It wasn't quite as much food as it was needed, more people in the urban areas who needed silver currency and therefore uh, more chance of bidding up prices of goods. Population is growing, that's putting demands on agriculture. All of this setting the stage for inflationary increases. So that's how we think it happened, huh? particularly the arrival of silver bullion from the New World. But even more importantly is, okay, so what does it mean? It all sounds very, you know, well, sort of half fascinating. Uh, it's kind of technical, and, you know, do I care? Well, yes, because it had, as I said, truly profound effects on Europe, its societies, and its economies. One of the things that had happened prior to the price revolution was that landowners had begun converting to cash payments from the peasants that worked on the land. The old system was largely in the form of labor service and barter. In other words, I'm the landowner, I control all of these peasants, and what they have to do is they have to provide so many days of work per month to me. Uh, they have to gather firewood for me and a few other services of various kinds. They have to, of course, work on my land. Uh, but increasingly, many landowners were turning towards simply having the pay peasants pay money instead of meeting many of those obligations. Like, you know, for example, the urban populations, many landowners are moving off the land and into the cities. It's nicer to live there. 
a little dirtier, but it has more amenities. You can't go to the theater out in the middle of the boondocks. For them, they can't really practically have the peasants dragging in firewood to them you know, a couple of times a week. So you get the peasants to pay you cash, and then you'll buy the firewood in the city. So many landowners in Europe, places like England and France, Germany, were converting to cash payments. They hadn't turned entirely to cash, but more and more of these small obligations of peasants were being converted into cash payments. And they were fixed. <coughs> the problem is now inflation is undermining the value of that payment. Be like saying, well, look at, instead of uh, giving me uh, two gallons of gasoline every week, I just want you to give me uh, six bucks, because it's, you know, be about, that's what it cost. Okay, that's fine now, but suppose five years from now, <laughs> the price of gasoline has gone up to four dollars. That'll probably be tomorrow, never mind, five years from now. So now it's gone up to four dollars, so that gas that I was substituting the cash payment with, that gas is now worth eight dollars, but I'm only getting six still. <laughs> but I still have to go out and buy my own gas, so now I'm out two bucks. This is basically what happens. You've got a fixed payment in cash, but prices are rising, so the cash you're getting is worth less. You gotta do something about it. How do we deal with this problem? Landowners in England came up with one solution. It was called the enclosure movement. They said to peasants, basically, they're called yeomen in England, uh, the people who worked on the land for the landowner. Uh, landowners said, uh, listen, I get some uh, good news and some bad news. You don't have to make those payments anymore, but you can't live here <laughs> either. <laughs> get out of here. I'm throwing you off the land. Um, what they were doing is enclosing the land. Instead of having an estate where there were these small properties all over it worked by individual peasants, they were going to throw most of the peasants off and literally enclose their land with fences. Why? So they could raise sheep. It's low labor costs. You can have relatively few peasants tending the sheep. It's a cash crop, if you want to call it that, a cash product. And if prices are going to be going up, well, the price of wool is going to go up. So you'll get more money over time instead of these fixed rents that you've been getting from the peasants. This is a much better way to deal with the problem of inflation because you're now producing a commercial product with an increasing price as inflation rises. It's also basically the start of capitalism because in the past, these relationships were the remnants of the old feudal system. Many of these peasants had been living on the land, you know, their families, their ancestors, for generations. And while feudalism itself may have declined, there was still a sense of obligation between the two sides, that the landowner, yes, lets you stay, and he knows that he can count on these loyal servants and attenders that he has working on the land. Well, they basically said, forget all that stuff, you know, about patron-client relations, all that good stuff, get out of here. Okay, now on, it's business. I'm going to produce the most profitable thing I can produce. I'm not worried about loyalty. I don't care a hoot about having lots of loyal peasants around me. You know, who likes peasants? Anyways, uh, i got to make money. So we're going to go from what was left of the old feudal system into the beginnings of what's really capitalism. It's going to be a market-driven process. In France, a somewhat similar situation occurred. In that country, what happened was that landowners, rather than throwing people off the land, started to squeeze them for more. What often happened was that 
you would have, let us say, a situation in which a landowner's father had converted certain services into cash payment. And they largely let those services lapse. You know, now that you're making a payment every month, you don't have to, you know, gather firewood or provide me with part of the wine that you make. Don't worry about it. Just give me that cash. What landowners began doing, but the obligations were never legally abolished. So landowners began going back now and saying, yeah, I want the cash, but I also want the wine. I want the cash, I also want the firewood. I'm going to go back and charge both. So I'm going to squeeze the peasants. Now they've got to pay cash, as they have been in recent generations, but now they also have to go back and meet these obligations that had largely been forgotten and allowed to lapse. But legally, I have the right to collect them. So what happens is they're squeezing the peasants. They're staying on the land. They're not being thrown off. But now they've got to pay more and more. And you know that obligation where you had to come and work on my land two days a week? Now it's three. <laughs> Sorry. That's the way it goes. So their response in how to deal with inflation was to squeeze more out of the peasants on the land, whereas the British, their answer was to throw people off the land. In both cases, we're getting the beginnings of a capitalistic process. How can you most efficiently use the property that you have? And the idea, look, it's yours to use in any way you see fit. And you don't have particular obligations to people that have been living on the land and past feudal arrangements and so forth. The issue is, can you make a profit by using that land in the most efficient way possible? Aside from the fact that this helps lay the groundwork for full-blown capitalism in the centuries to come, something else happened along the way. Uh, one thing is that England experienced a revolution in the 17th century, and France experienced a revolution in the 18th century. And while it would be simplistic, to say the least, to suggest that England's revolution was all about the enclosure movement, and France's revolution was all about squeezing the peasants, the fact is, in both instances, this radical change in the relationship between landowners and peasants did play a major role in the coming of both revolutionary movements. Later on, we're going to look at, in the age of revolutions, the English Civil War or the English Revolution and the French Revolution. And the fact is that part of those processes, which bring profound new changes to Europe, are rooted in the simple matter of silver flowing out of the Americas into Spain, into the rest of Europe, setting off inflation and setting off other changes that eventually became profound political and social changes as well. Now, one other example of responding to this process occurred in Germany and Russia. In Germany and Russia, it was not so much that silver flowed into these areas, which were pretty far removed from the main source, Spain, but rather that as the European economies in the western part of Europe began accelerating, they're being fueled by this silver pouring in, German and Russian landowners saw a great opportunity. Remember, there's a shortage of agricultural products. They realized that they could make a great deal of money from this rapidly growing inflationary set of economies in the West by shipping grain to the urban areas in the West. So they wanted to produce more grain, wheat in particular, so they could ship it to the West and take advantage of this inflationary process that was rapidly accelerating prices and increasing demand for agricultural goods. And they did that. And the way they did it was by imposing essentially serfdom on their peasant populations. Essentially serfs who had been free, who had been like peasants in Western Europe, uh, were now made property. They became the property of the estate on which they worked. Just like the cattle, like farm tools, they were treated as property. And so you could work them day and night, as long as you wanted, because there was nothing they could do about it. They're slaves in all but name. The only difference between a slave and a serf is the fact that a slave could be sold off individually as a group. 
you couldn't sell serfs unless you were selling the estate. They had to remain part of the estate. Other than that, they really were slaves. So what happens in Germany and Russia is that, again, there's a squeezing of the rural population economically. And there's also a basic loss of freedom on the part of peasants who can no longer move around and choose to settle and work on another estate. Now they can no longer do that because they're serfs. This had a couple of consequences too in the long run, as we will see. In Germany, it would contribute to the rise of fascism several centuries later. And in Russia, it would lead to the Russian Revolution and the rise of communism. This might have little consequences. Uh, all of this flowing out of a geez, you know, How did we get from Spanish silver to the Russian Revolution? Not that hard. Uh, but it indicates just how profound these changes were, how earth-shaking they were, even though at the time, there were almost things that you don't notice. You know, if there were newspapers, which there really weren't in the 1500s, these wouldn't be headline grabbers. You know, people wouldn't say, oh, well, they're squeezing peasants in the countryside in Germany. Who would notice? It was a gradual process, but in the long run, incredible consequences coming from all of this. Something else that happened was that the artisan system, the guilds of artisans that controlled the work of skilled laborers, people who, let's say, leather workers, people who made uh, silverware, uh, people who created hardware, glass, all of these skilled professions, clothing. Hmm. These systems, remember, had worked on the idea of a just price, that the guild would set a price that was adequate to compensate the artisan and at the same time would not overly exploit the consumer. Hmm. So there's not really going to be massive competition. This is not a free market in this case either, because the guilds are fixing the prices. But that's going to become difficult to maintain as prices start going up, because there's pressure on everyone. Grain costs more, so bread costs more. So you're an artisan, so what about raising my prices? I have to compensate. How do we become more efficient? Remember, the landowners are figuring out ways. They're doing enclosure. They're squeezing their peasants more. How do I become more efficient to deal with inflation so I can ensure that I have sufficient income in a time of rising prices? Well, one of the ways is to switch out of this system of guilds where people are trained over the years in the profession and instead turn to wage labor to say, hey, I like it. I'm not looking for specialists anymore, and the product I may produce may not be quite the quality that the guilds insisted upon in the past, but I can produce far more of that product. So I can help combat inflation. I can charge lower prices because I'll produce more of this good and help keep prices down. And I'll do it using people that I simply hire for wages, who may not be as skilled as the artisans of the past, but who will produce a comparable product for a lower price. That competition is triggered not only by the challenges of inflation, but by the fact that all the silver pouring in has provided capital for people to invest. There's a lot of money around. So people are investing in new production processes. You know, maybe we don't have to do everything by hand. Maybe we can invest in some kind of primitive machinery. You know, new ways, new machines for weaving cloth that'll be more efficient. Because now we have the money to buy such machines, to invest in machines, to test them out. So we can produce product faster. Again, it's lesser quality, but there's more of it. And it'll help keep prices down. So we're seeing the evolution of a market economy where supply and demand are going to help drive people's decisions on how they're going to produce products, how they're going to interact with other people in producing those products, namely through wages. All of this being driven again by this silver flowing in, 
helps trigger investments, helps trigger increased productivity with the introduction of simple but effective machines, such as new kinds of looms for weaving cloth. Another important development in the same process, in the rise of mass production, in the rise of market economies, was sugar. Sugar was important in this process, even though it was being produced far from Europe and the Americas, because it was a classic kind of modern industry. You needed capital. You needed money for machinery and labor. Why for labor? Because you had to buy slaves, of course. But you needed lots of money to invest. Sugar production was not for some peasant you know, who has a couple of simple farm implements in his hand. That won't work. You need machinery to grind up the sugar, to boil it down, to sack it. And you need massive amounts of labor, forced labor in the form of slaves, and they cost a lot of money. Here is a mass-produced product. And it requires technology and capital, things that are now increasingly available. So it becomes a mass production product instead of just this scarce, specialized, high-priced good, it would become a mass-produced and mass-consumed item. In 1400, sugar is still basically an exotic product, one of these precious goods <laughs> like spices. But by 1700, sugar consumption in England was at least four pounds a person annually which helps explain why the British all had rotten teeth. Uh, <laughs> and this did happen. I mean, let's say dental health <laughs> in Europe disintegrated uh, with the arrival of massive amounts of sugar because it rotted people's teeth out. But on the other hand, it was an increasingly cheap source of calories. And for many people in urban areas in particular, you know, food is scarce. One thing you can get a hold of that will at least give you some calories is sugar because it's relatively cheap. Sugar demonstrates the whole idea of economies of scale in a very practical way. It sets the standard for other industries that are going to come in capitalist systems. The idea of massive production that helps lower prices. You not only do it in sugar, if you can do it making hardware, then artisans have to adjust, they have to do the same thing. I have to mass produce. I have to be able to lower the price of my good because I'm in competition. This is a market system. So silver and sugar coming out of these highly controlled, monopolized trading networks actually set off conditions. They're going to create highly competitive market economies. Hmm. These phenomena, as I suggested, challenge the logic of the gills and the just price. The idea that, look, at, we will set quality standards and we will keep prices at a certain level. All of that's falling apart because inflationary pressures are making it difficult to maintain prices at any fixed level for any length of time, and because now the sugar industry has demonstrated with infusions of capital and technology, you can produce a product and drastically lower its price because of the quantity you produce. So now we're getting into mass production, market competition, wage labor, all of these things driven in no small part by the silver, and the sugar of the new world. A true economic revolution is taking place in Europe to begin with that will spread across the globe over the next few centuries, all from a couple of simple exchanges of commodities. So what we've been looking at today are the economic and social effects of trade networks. Again, trade clearly has vast consequences. We saw even in the pre-modern world and the early modern world that trade was not only the exchange of products, involved the exchange of ideas, such as religious ideas, and of course could lead to the rapid spread of epidemic disease. But there's even more to it than that. As these trading networks 
expand and extend out across the globe, they begin to profoundly affect how people go about their daily lives. Many of these networks, particularly the European ones, were set upon the idea that they would have tightly controlled systems, these mercantilist systems, believing that there was a limited supply of wealth in the world. So the more that you controlled and the more you could exclude others from, the wealthier you would become because it's a zero-sum <coughs> game. But those very networks as they were created by the Portuguese, by the Spanish, by the British, helped set off a counter challenge in the forms of piracy and smuggling. Piracy and smuggling, whatever the private motives of the pirates and the smugglers were, were direct challenges to these systems, demonstrating the power of market forces against the attempts to politically control economic systems. A second critical effect is the flow of silver species, silver currency, from the Americas into Europe. The Spanish economy, unable to supply its own colonies with sufficient goods of its own manufacture, reaches out to suppliers in England, the Netherlands, and France. And as a result, the tons of silver flowing into Spain soon spread out into the rest of Europe. And they set off a process of inflation. As more and more currency is available, people can bid up the price of goods. And of course, there are contributing factors. This is a period when population is growing, particularly in the urban areas. Food is already a bit scarce anyway, so these pressures of population and relative food scarcity are pushing prices up anyways. But now, there's a massive infusion of currency to further accelerate the process uh, to bring on inflation of four, five, six percent a year. Changes in prices that simply were unknown in human experience of the time. That price revolution sets landowners in Europe off on several different directions trying to compensate for the effects of inflation to deal with the fact that fixed payments in cash are being undermined by inflation. British landowners enclose their land, set their course on grazing of sheep to have a commercial product whose price will also rise with inflation. The French squeeze their peasants by not only collecting cash payments, but by reinstituting the old service obligations that dated back to the feudal era. And in Eastern Europe, Germany and Russia, the response by landowners is to rob their peasants of their freedom, reduce them to serfdom, so that they can create more agricultural product to feed into the rapidly growing economies in the West. And all of these changes would have profound effects in revolutionary upheavals that would occur over the next several centuries. Sugar, of course, helps set the standard for mass production manufacturing. Hmm. The infusions of large amounts of capital and technology to produce a product which up until then had been a precious good available only to a few, now could be mass produced at a low price and made available to the masses. Of course, along the way, all of this, as we've seen, leads to greater exploitation of people at the bottom. Whether you're a German or Russian serf, whether you're a French peasant or a British yeoman who no longer has any land, or one of the millions of Africans who were taken as slaves, mostly to help man the sugar industry in the Americas, Although some also can, of course, go to North America for the cotton industry, but much of it to sugar. This is another consequence of trade in sugar and silver. And finally, all of this, the changes in prices, the challenge to the artisan guilds, all of this is leading to processes like the enclosure movement, mass production. They're putting together 
in their response to these two trade products, mechanisms and relationships that found the basis of modern day capitalism. All of this stemming from two simple trade products coming out of the Americas from the 1500s into the 1800s. Okay, next time we're going to move on, look at some other ideas about change in world systems and the rise of modernity.